Within witchcraft, there are so many different techniques for carrying out our spell work. From poppets and candle magic to knot magic and verbal charms, it's understandably quite confusing, especially for a beginner, when you're trying to decide what's going to work best for you and your particular intention. So today we're going to be going through some of the most popular techniques for spell work and talking about why you might use each one. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll have a better understanding of what's most suitable for you. <music> To kick things off, we're starting with poppets. Now, a poppet is one of the most misunderstood aspects of magical practice. They're simply a magical doll. Now, these dolls are used in sympathetic magic, that being like attracts like, and they're used as representation for a person or animal in spell work and ritual, especially if that person or animal isn't able to be present. These dolls can be used for so many different reasons, but usually they are created in the likeness of a person. They'll often include tag locks or other items that link that doll onto the target of that working. So it could be a whisker from your cat, it could be a photograph of your friend or loved one that you want to do that spell on, and those are added into the creation of the doll so that it links that doll onto the target of that working. Now you can make these dolls in many different ways. The main goal is for them to at least have a passing resemblance to the person or animal that you're doing that working on. They can be made out of fabric, clay, wax, wood, stone, whatever it is that you have access to and that suits your working. Now these poppets are primarily used when the target of that working does not want to or is not able to be present in that working, but they can also be used on yourself if you do struggle with casting spells and rituals on yourself. So some examples of using a poppet might be that your loved one is traveling abroad Broad. They aren't able to come home so that you can cast that spell or ritual on them, and so instead you create a poppet for them. This representational poppet is then kept safe and secure. Spells are then cast upon this poppet to offer that person extra protection, and that protection then manifests in their physical life halfway across the world. Another example could be a pet that is really ill. Maybe they're in their vets and they're really struggling. You have a whisker of theirs and you want to offer them some additional healing. You might want to create a fabric poppet and inside you might want to put healing herbs and items that represent them. And then you would nurture that poppet, cast healing spells upon that poppet in the hope that it might aid their healing alongside any treatments and any medications that they might need to take from the vet. If you do struggle casting spells and rituals on yourself, maybe you struggle because there isn't a physical object for you to work with, you can create a poppet that is a representation of yourself. This poppet contains your tag locks, your energies, and then you cast your spells onto the poppet, which then trickles over from the astral plane into the physical world and starts to manifest in your own life. Poppets are so variable. You can also use poppets for baneful magic if that's something that you are interested in. And the kind of materials that you use and techniques that you carry out is going to vary depending depending on your personal practice. But they are a great technique, especially if the target of that spell or ritual is not able to be present. Similar in a way to a poppet is a spell bag or pouch. Now these are small bags, sometimes they're handmade in a specific color to represent your intention, that are then filled with herbs, crystals, items that represent your goals, and then they are sealed up and either carried around with you or placed in locations of significance. So for instance, if it is a spell to help you focus at work, you might want to keep it on your desk or in your desk drawer. If it is something to help bring out psychic dreams, you might want to keep it under your bed. If it's something to make you more confident and more likable, then carrying it around with you on a day-to-day -day basis is a great way of doing this. These bags are ideal if you want long-term manifestation of a goal and you want to be able to carry it around with you, which makes it really useful if you do live in a space where you can't just leave things lying around, you have to carry things with you all of the time. These spell bags and pouches can be really good. They can also be given to other people, so if you do have a friend or a relative that would like some additional magical support, but they don't know how to carry out spells and rituals themselves, you can create a spell bag for for them and then you can gift it to them so then they can carry it around and have it manifested in their life. This style of practice can be really good if you aren't great at using tag locks. I do have a full video on the subject that I will link in the description box if you do want to learn more about that. Because you're essentially carrying it around with you all of the time, it's going to be releasing that energy and manifesting around itself. So as long as that spell bag is around you, it's going to manifest in your life.
life. If that spell bag is around someone else, it's going to manifest in their life. And so where it manifests is going to be where it spends the majority of its time. So that can be really good. They're really good for people who are just getting started with spells and rituals, and you aren't too comfortable with using tag locks just yet. Next up, we have spell bowls. Now a spell bowl is exactly what you might think it is. It's a bowl that contains items that are associated with your spell and your desired outcome. These bowls are often left out on altar spaces or in rooms where you want that energy to manifest. They're fairly similar to spell bags in that they contain the items that represent your target intention, your desired outcome, except instead of carrying them around with you, they stay within the location you want that energy to manifest. They're also particularly good if you do like something that's very tactile, that you can dig your hands into, that you can energize frequently by touching it. So it can be really good if you want to work more in the physical world and less in the spiritual world. Now there are a few downsides to spell bowls. The first is that you're not really going to want them if you've got any pets or children that might pull a spell bowl off the side, or if it contains any kind of herbs or items that might be dangerous to them. And they're also not necessarily suitable if you live in an environment when you can't be open about your magical practice. But they can be really good if you want to energize an entire space, as they do often have a wider area of influence than a spell bag might. Next up, we have bottles and jars. These are often used to contain energy. Now a good example of this would be a witch's bottle. Historically, witch's bottles were used to contain the urine of a target of a witchcraft attack. It was believed that this urine contained a part of that witch's essence, and so by trapping it in that bottle and heating it up, it would irritate the witch and force them to come back, apologize, and undo the spell. Modern practitioners today still use witches' bottles in a slightly different way. They act as a scapegoat, that being an energetic double of yourself, so that any unwanted energies and spirits that target you will go into the witches' bottle instead. Once inside that bottle, they are then contained, they cannot escape, and then the practitioner can dispose of it accordingly. Now this is a great way of using a bottle, especially if it is sealed and inside there are pins or perhaps entwining thread that is going to trap and contain that spirit and that energy. Now spell jars can be used for a similar purpose. Purpose. They're used to contain energy, but they can be taken in two different directions. So in some cases, you might want to contain something that is causing you or someone else harm. Similar to a binding spell or a freezer spell, you want to stop that situation in its tracks. And so within that jar, you place representations of what you want to stop, as well as items and ingredients that are going to aid in that. And then you seal it and put it away somewhere and you do not open it. You leave it in the dark to sit and ruminate and stagnate. And that is the goal for that situation. The other method of using a spell jar is still containment, but it's more along the lines of preserve much like how you preserve food and several months down the line it is still good to eat and in some cases even better than it was before that is the same that can be done with spell jars now they aren't instantaneous in this form they often take weeks even months to improve and get better but you add items and representation into that jar of something you want to maintain and improve and over time while it is sitting with positive energies and positive thoughts it amplifies and it magnifies within that jar so that when you're ready, you can open it, release that energy, and you have even more of what you wanted to preserve in the first place. Both of these techniques offer containment of energy, it's just you can take it in several different ways. But if you do want something that's quick and instantaneous, spell jar might not be for you, you might be better off doing something like candle magic, or even poppets or bag spells, because especially for positive goals where you want to magnify it over time, it is going to take some time to build up that energy. With that being said, let's talk about candle magic. Magic. Candle magic is probably my favorite form of magical practice. If you've been on this channel for a while, you will know that I use candle magic a lot. And that's because it's so versatile. You can use it for positive magic and negative magic, short term and long term. And it could be good if you do enjoy working with candles or the fire element. Candle magic can be done in many ways, but two of the most popular methods would be to use the candle as a vessel for energy. So you charge the candle with your energy when you can, and then you release that energy by burning it. This is particularly good if you do struggle with your energy or mobility, or you can only work during certain times of the day or certain days of the week. It means that you can charge it with the energy when you can and then release it when you need it. The other form of working with candles is to use them as a representation of the fire element and to work with that elemental energy. This is really good if you do want to start dabbling into elemental magic and aren't really sure where to start. Both of these forms of candle magic are incredibly powerful and can be used in so many different ways. 
You can use a massive candle that takes days and days and days to burn. You would put pins in the side to represent where you need to start burning, snuff it out every time, and then every day you would relight it again. And this technique allows you to burn candles for weeks, even months on end. You can also use really small candles such as tea lights, which burn for four hours, or birthday candles, which burn for about 10 to 15 minutes. And you can do your spells just during the duration of time that that candle burns. There is so much flexibility, and that's why I think I love candle magic so much. But as with all candles, when it comes to witchcraft, make sure that you are using fire safety, make sure that you're always safe, never leave a burning candle unattended, etc, etc. I'm hoping that you will know your candle safety. If not, I would advise learning a little bit more about it before you start your journey in candle magic. Another spell work technique is the use of sigils. Now, sigils are magical symbols that have been created to represent a specific goal and intention, and they're usually taken in one of two directions. Either they are charged with energy while you are creating them, which allows you to wear them, carve them into candles, and so on and so forth, or they are created by their destruction, such as setting it on fire. Sigils are incredibly useful magical tools, but they're usually very short term unless they're added into a much larger working. But they can be great if you do want something a little bit more tactile, if you are very creative with your magical practice. It could be a great way of adding some artwork into your spells and rituals. You can use them alone or alongside other forms of practice. The next technique is knot magic and cord magic, and this is a technique that I wish was more spoken of. It's essentially the idea of knotting your energy into a length of cord. Now, cord magic can be as complex or as simple as you like, but I'll keep it fairly simple in today's video. Now, a good example historically of this were the peddlers and charmers who used to sell the wind to sailors on the coasts of Britain. They would enchant knots and trap the wind within them. So when the sailor needed favorable winds to guide them out of danger, they would undo a knot and the wind would blow them on a safe course. Now this technique can be adapted into our own magical practice. A length of cord is taken and several knots are tied in it. Sometimes it's one, three, seven, nine, thirteen, depending on your tradition. And as each of these knots is pulled taut, you breathe your intention through it and you snap it shut. This traps that intention and that energy inside that knot so it can then be released at a later date. If you need good luck, then you would energize this cord with good luck, seal it within the knots, and then release one every time you needed it. If you wanted something to be incredibly powerful, with an entire coven of practitioners, each of you can add your intentions into a singular knot, and then at the end of that ritual, you burn that knot in an open fire, using fire safety, of course. This releases all of that energy all at once and magnifies all of that power because every individual has added their own energy into that spell. This can also be taken the other way. If you want something to be trapped, you seal it inside the knots and then you don't release it. Instead, you dispose of it. You might put it into a bin, you might keep it in a dark place and never let it see the light of day ever again. You might allow it to rot in the earth as long as it is completely biodegradable. There are so many different ways of using knot magic, but this is a good technique for temporarily containing energy to release it at a later date. And lastly, we have verbal charms. Now, verbal charms are commonly seen alongside other forms of magical practice. You'll often see them being used with candle spells, with poppets, with bags, but they can be used alone. A verbal charm is a simplistic chain of words. This might be something that you have created yourself or that you've taken from another resource. This could be a poem. This could be some folk charms that have been passed down to you. Some people will even use psalms within the Bible. They're usually quite memorable and sometimes they'll even rhyme. These charms can be used alone or they can be repeated three, nine, thirty times and in some cases allow us to drop more easily into a trance-like state. They can also be used alongside other forms of magical practice to add extra power and potency. For some magical practitioners, they don't use anything other than their verbal charms and their energy. And that's really what I want to end today's video on. There are lots of different techniques for spells and rituals, lots of tools and items and additions and things. But when it comes to magical practice, sometimes the most powerful form of practice is simply yourself and your energy. Ultimately, everything else is an addition. They allow us to focus easier on what we want to manifest. And especially if you're just getting started, they can be really useful to help focus us on our goals, but they aren't a requirement for magical practice. You can have a powerful and successful magical practice with nothing more than your intention, your focus, your energy, and your effort. Everything else is something that can help, but isn't necessarily a requirement unless you want to include them. 
So with that being said, I hope that you did learn from this video. I hope that you found it useful. I would love to know the kind of techniques that you employ within your own magical practice. Do you include anything different from this video? Do let me know. If you did enjoy this video, feel free to give it a like. It means a lot to me and it lets me know which videos you like. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, feel free to post a comment down in the comment section. And if you do enjoy the magical content on this channel in this video, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. So with that being said, I hope you're all staying safe. I hope you're having a marvelous, magical day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!